Hello everyone and welcome to Arcade Viking. Today is the official 14th and unofficial 9th video in my series on the early Imperial expansion of the United States. The subjects of today's video are the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations in North Mississippi and Arkansas in the early Imperial United States. So right off the bat, uh, I'm sure everyone, at least everyone within the United States who is watching this, uh, when you hear the names Mississippi and Arkansas, you think of the United States states here on this map, Arkansas and, and Mississippi, which is an understandable conclusion to come to after all. This they uh, these two states have had their shape and political boundaries uh, for around 160 years, give or take, since at least the 1840s, uh, if not, you know, a little more. So obviously, literally everyone who is alive now, <laughs> uh, the only way we know these states is how they is how they are now. That's how we've always known them. But they have not always been like this. Uh, Arkansas and Mississippi only took on their shape, their political boundaries, after a long series of catalysts, uh, processes, and events. So in order to better understand how Arkansas and Mississippi became the way they are now, we need to go a little bit back in time to get a better look at the larger picture. And with that, that leads us to our first section in the video, the Mississippian period, specifically the focusing on the Mississippian culture. So as I've talked about in my previous videos in the series, uh, the Mississippian culture was a cultural phase, a cultural practice that originated with the rising of the city of Cahokia in what is now uh, the states of Illinois and Missouri. And it was a massive city metropolis in North America. Um, as I talked about in my video on early uh, myths about, uh, you know, on uh, myths about the medieval period, uh, Cahokia had a population of somewhere between twenty to 50,000 people, which exceeded the, uh, the population of cities like London at the same time. So it was very large, uh, and it had a you know, fairly large cultural uh, time of cultural hegemony, you know, of, of you know, cultural significance from around 900 to 1350 CE. Uh, and it would be where uh, from it would be where Mississippi culture would spread out throughout the eastern woodlands. And after that, it would spread into the western part of what is now Alabama, uh, where the ancestors of various different Native American groups, including but not only the Chickasaw, would eventually create their own metropolis uh, that would be the Moundville chiefdom, uh, the city of Moundville, which, as I again, I talked about in my video on this about the medieval world, uh, Moundville itself had a very large population, not as large as Cahokia, but still a population of around sixteen to 20,000 people, which was still very large and still rivaled, if not succeeded, European cities like, say, York, England. Uh, and it also had a very large, much like Kofi, it had a very large uh, period of cultural and political hegemony ranging from around 1,000 to 1450 CE. Also, during this time, as the Mississippi culture was rising and spreading throughout the eastern woodlands of North America, the Quapaw would, uh, the Quapaw peoples would separate from the uh, uh, Hegian or Dehegian speaking ancestors, uh, their Dehegian speaking ancestors, and would begin to gradually migrate uh, from the Ohio River Valley to the Mississippi River 
by maybe 950 CE at the earliest uh, and at least by 1513 CE at the latest. And here is like a map of the uh, the Higgian or Higgian uh, speaking peoples and their migrations. After the collapse of the Moundville chiefdom, the Chickasaw Nation would begin to rise in northern Mississippi from the combination of peoples from the remnants of the Moundville chiefdom, as well as the uh, Plaquemine, or also known as the Coles Creek culture, uh, in somewhere around the 1500s CE. Uh, and that's sort of to give you a context of where the Chickasaw were beginning to sort of rise as a political entity. And of course, eventually, the this new nation would come into contact with Europeans. So the first contact between the Chickasaw Nation and Europeans uh, came in the DeSoto expedition, an expedition led by Fernando de Soto, a Spanish conquistador, uh, where, who decided to take uh, an expedition of several hundred fellow conquistadors to explore the southeastern, uh, what would become the southeastern United States in the search of gold and things like that. He would eventually come across, uh, his expedition would eventually come across the Chickasaw Nation, uh, where he would demand 200 men as porters to get across the Mississippi River uh, from the Chickasaw Nation. The Chickasaw, however, would refuse his demand and would later on attack the Spanish camp during the night sometime in spring of 1541 CE, uh, defeating and driving away DeSoto uh, from their villages. It would not end the DeSoto expedition, but they most certainly did defeat it. Well, afterwards, DeSoto would go on to encounter the Pacha and the Keys Keys, chiefdoms in what is now Arkansas, who may very likely be the ancestors of the Quapaw. However, this is still debated due to the unknown time of the Quapaw migration into Arkansas. Remember, you know, that it could be anywhere between nine from 950 to 1513 CE, uh, uh, which is in large part thanks to the uncertain archaeological record. And what I mean is while we have the uh, archaeological record of people living here in Arkansas during that time period, obviously, um, it's a, very difficult to discern the difference between Mississippi and, and later Quapaw traits up until a certain point, up until that 1513 CE, you know, time span. Uh, and here's a map of those uh, encounters that the Soto had uh, around that time during his expedition in Arkansas and Mississippi. Later on, uh, the uh, Chickasaw and the Quapaw Nation would come into contact with other European nations, uh, specifically after the establishment of the colony of Carolina. For those of you who are watching from North Carolina and South Carolina, yes, <laughs> the, uh, the Carolinas used to be one singular Carolina, um, with this Carolina colony being established in 1665 CE. And, and then shortly after that, the Chickasaw Nation would establish a relationship with the British and then shortly after that, the uh, French Empire would found what is known as Arkansas Post in 1686 CE uh, with the Quapaw Nation establishing a relationship with the French Empire. Uh, and then after that, both the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations would, would become major participants in both the Native American slave trade and the deerskin trade with both nations often raiding each other for captives to be sold at European markets. And here are pictures sort of uh, giving you visuals of those different industries and economies. And then only a few decades after uh, contact between the Chickasaw Nation and the British Empire, Scottish, uh, sorry, Scotch-Irish migrants would begin to migrate into and settle in the American Southeast, including the Chickasaw Nation, uh, somewhere around the 1710s CE. 
And of course, right around this time, the French Empire was beginning to expand into the North American interior, eventually founding the colony uh, of Louisiana with New Orleans as its capital city. Uh, this would lead to the Chickasaw Nation and the French Empire becoming bitter enemies as Britain and France were rivals in trade. Uh, and here is the New Orleans here. Um, and this is uh, sort of the expansion of the French Empire during that time period. As you can see, it started off very small, you know, just a few little slivers of territory in what would be now the Midwestern part of the United States, and as well as the Southeastern part here with Mississippi, uh, and then eventually encompassing huge chunks of the Southeastern part and the Midwestern part of the North American continent. Uh, right around this time as well, the French would go to war with and defeat the Natchez nation, uh, which would, uh, and they would also after defeating them, um, of course, subjugate and begin exporting a lot of them for the Native American slave trade. Uh, they would destroy the uh, power and influence of the Natchez Nation uh, that would eventually lead to large numbers of Natchez refugees fleeing to and joining the Chickasaw Nation, uh, with all this happening somewhere around 1729 CE. <laughs> At the same time, the French would ally with another very powerful Native American nation in the southeastern uh, uh, part of what is now the United States, known as the Choctaw Nation, which I've already done a video on in this series. Uh, and uh, specifically, the governor of the colony of Louisiana, John Baptiste uh, Le Monnier de Bienville, would make this alliance with the Choctaw because he sought to end Chickasaw trade with the British Empire. And so he would uh, essentially suggest and um, essentially uh, probably pay even in a lot of ways, the Choctaw Nation to launch repeated attacks and raids on the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, also, uh, another side effect a uh, major side effect, I, one could argue the largest side effect of uh, contact with Europeans uh, between the Chickasaw Nation and Europeans, uh, as well as the Pawpaw Nation, would be epidemics such as uh, smallpox epidemics that would lead to uh, the population of both the Chickasaw and Pawpaw Nations to decline dramatically, with the Pawpaw Nation alone numbering only between 500 to 800 individuals by the 1750s CE. Uh, and of course, as I already talked about in a video, previous video that I will link in the iCard, uh, as they were allied with the British, the Chickasaw Nation would go to uh, war with the French Empire in multiple wars known as the Chickasaw Wars, and they would actually defeat the French Empire in all three of these wars, including at the Battle of uh, Achaea in 1736 CE, with all of these wars happening between 1736 and 1752 CE. Though, it is also important to note, despite uh, these wars ending in 1752 CE, skirmishes would continue between the Chickasaw Nation and France until France ceded its claim to all of its territory east of the Mississippi River after being defeated by the British Empire in the Seven Years' War. And another interesting factor of that, uh, of what was happening during the Seven Years' War that would eventually lead to the French losing their uh, control, the control of their territory east of the Mississippi, would be the fact that both the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations remained relatively neutral, mostly neutral, in the Seven Years' War. I mean, there were a few exceptions. For example, the Chickasaw did uh, occasionally lead raids on French allied uh, Native American nations and things like that. But by and large, both the Quapaw Nation and the Chickasaw Nation would remain neutral. 
And then this in itself would eventually lead to the Chicksong Quapa nations forming a permanent military and economic alliance in 1766 CE. Which now leads us actually to our next section because that alliance is very important for this. Uh, the Chicksong nation Which actually brings us to our next section, because this alliance between the Chicksaw and Quapaw nations would become very important in the later years in the relationship between the Chicksaw and Quapaw nations and the United States. So, first off, this relationship between the two nations and the United States would begin during the American Revolution when the 13 British colonies went to war with the British Empire. Uh, attempting to gain independence. Uh, during this conflict, the Chickasaw and Quapaw nations would remain mostly neutral, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, for one thing, uh, it is important to note that uh, fairly early on in the conflict, uh, the new, uh, what would be essentially the continental uh, Army, the Continental Congress, the predecessor to the United States, would fear the Chickasaw Quapaw Alliance and also sought to control the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. So, with those goals in mind, the Continental Army would uh, go into Chickasaw territory and would construct what is known what was known as Fort Jefferson within Chickasaw territory. Uh, angered by this, the Chickasaw Nation would attack and burn down the fort uh, and drive, temporarily drive, the Continental Army and by proxy the eventual United States out of their territory. And this would happen between 1779 and 1781 CE. Furthermore, uh, due to the geopolitical situation after the Seven Years' War, the Chick uh, Chickasaw Nation nominally, uh, nominally sided with the British Empire, while the Quapaw Nation nominally sided with the Spanish Empire during this conflict. And you can see why in, in this map here, because after the Seven Years' War, what used to be the French territory was eventually split down the middle by the Spanish Empire and the British Empire with both of them taking that. And as you can see, the Chickasaw Nation was, for the most part, in the British Empire, and the Quapaw Nation was, for the most part, in the Spanish Empire. So it just made the most political sense to at least, in part, ally themselves with these respective empires. Uh, and this in itself led to some minor conflicts between the two allied nations uh, when a raid was led on a Spanish uh, fort known as Arkansas Fort um, uh, during the American Revolution that consisted of several uh, Chickasaw and Quapaw warriors. There weren't very many. There was only 11 Chickasaw and four Quapaw warriors that were really involved in this fight. Um, there, there, there were a little bit more than that, but generally there were, that's uh, the number that can be confirmed. Um, and it didn't last very long. It was, it was a, essentially what happened is the British got there, they planned to make an assault, but the Spanish and their few Quapaw warriors that were inside the fort just charged out and essentially took the British uh, Chickasaw group by surprise, and the British force ran away uh, with neither side really suffering more than just a handful of casualties, and I mean like a legitimate handful, I think. Uh, it was memory service that there was like maybe five or six casualties on either side. Um, so it was very a very inconsequential event uh, that happened specifically in the final couple of years of the American Revolution in 1783 CE. And of course, this would not be the end of the relationship between the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations and the United States. In fact, uh, in the, uh, shortly after the eventual founding of the United States, uh, George Washington, the first president of the United States, as well as his cabinet, would begin to develop what was known as the Six Point Plan to civilize uh, the Native American nations of the Southeast, as well as in other places in the Northeast and the Plains and such. 
including but not limited to the Chicksaw and Quapaw Nations. Um, to achieve this goal, he would originally send uh, Benjamin Hawkins to live among the Chickasaw and other uh, Southeastern Native American nations, including the Quapaw, to facilitate this plan, uh, sending him to do this in 1785 CE. Just one year after that, in 1786 CE, the Chickasaw Nation and the United States would sign the Treaty of Hopewell, essentially bringing peace to in between the Chickasaw Nation and the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, later on in 1794 CE, specifically June 30th, 1794 CE, many Chickasaw warriors would fight with the United States against the Northwestern Confederacy in the Battle of Fort Recovery. Uh, I've already done a video on the Northwestern War with the Northwestern Confederacy that I will link in the ICAR. Then, just uh, a few years after that, after the Louisiana Purchase, the United States would finally encounter the Quapaw Nation in 1803 CE. Uh, and then just seven years after that, the United States would go on to construct Fort Hampton in Chickasaw Territory in the winter of 1810 CE. And here's sort of the design plan of that fort. Which actually leads us into uh, a next little uh, mini section within the video, the alliance between the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations and the United States in the War of 1812 CE. So, as many of us within the United States and Britain are aware, uh, in 1812 CE, the United States would go to war with the British Empire in, in a conflict that would uh, encompass all, basically all of the eastern half of the North American continent. Once this war began, the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations would side with the United States, with the Chickasaw Nation itself sending warriors led by Chickasaw Minkos, uh, their chief, their uh, political leaders, uh, such as brothers William Colbert and George Colbert, to help the United States in both the First Creek War, which was also part of the War of 1812, and I've already done a video on that, but again, I will include in the I-card, as well as the War of 1812 itself. But despite these uh, the uh, these uh, peaceable dealings, uh, these peace treaties, as well as the alliance in the War of 1812, that did not stop uh, land sessions, early land sessions from happening uh, between the United States and the Chickasaw and Quapaw nations. Um, of course, specifically, the Chickasaw and Quapaw were the ones who had to cede land to the United States. Uh, and this would start with a series of treaties known as the uh, Treaty of Tuscaloosa and the Jackson Purchase that resulted in uh, Chickasaw land sessions in Tennessee and Kentucky to the United States, happening between 1816 and 1818 CE. But specifically, the land sessions were not uh, were not specifically ratified until October 18th, 1818 CE. Uh, and then right around the same time, there was a treaty between the Quapaw Nation and the United States being signed, simply known as the Quapaw Treaty of 1818, where essentially the Quapaw Nation met with the United States at St. Louis on August 24th, 1818 CE to negotiate a new treaty. As part of the negotiations, the U.S. government acknowledged the Quapaw as the rightful owners of approximately 32 million acres of land, including all of present-day Arkansas, uh, south and west of the Arkansas River, as well as portions of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Oklahoma from the Red River beyond to uh, uh, from the River Red River to beyond the Arkansas and east of the Mississippi. However, the they required in this treaty that uh, the Quapaw cede almost thirty one million acres of this land uh, to the United States government, giving the Quapaw title only. Uh, to only one and a half million acres of their original land between the Arkansas and Saline rivers uh, in southeastern Arkansas. 
in exchange for the territory, the United States promised to uh, it promised four thousand uh, dollars, roughly seventy six thousand dollars in today's money, and an annual payment of a thousand dollars or nineteen thousand dollars in today's money uh, to the Guapa Nation. Uh, though a transaction error in Congress later removed most of Grant County, Arkansas, and part of Saline County, Arkansas, from the Squawpaw claim. Uh, and here is the source that I used for that. And here is just the, the pictures of the uh, tree itself. And here is, right here on this map, sort of the general area that the Squawpaw Nation was losing. All right, so now with that, we're going to uh, take a look at what Chickasaw society looked like during the early imperial United States, starting, of course, with Chickasaw and culture. So first off, uh, there, there are some major similarities and differences between the Chickasaw and Quapaw nations. So, for example, the Chickasaw nation is by and large a matrilineal culture, meaning kinship is traced through a female line, a person is identified with their mother's lineage, property is passed down from the mother's family, children are born into the clan of mother, uh, and take their social status from that clan. They are also a matrilocal society, where essentially a young couple marries, when the young couple marries, they go on and live with the woman's family. And women are in charge of agriculture, planting and harvesting the crops, as well as they were the ones who owned the agricultural fields. And this, by and large, was the standard, the common practice of 90% of the Native American cultures, uh, both in the Great Plains and in the Eastern Woodlands, and also the American Southwest. Meanwhile, the Quapa Nation was uh, actually very similar to uh, the Sauk and uh, Meskwaki Fox nations that we talked about a couple of videos ago, um, in that they were patrilineal in descent, meaning the kinship was traced to a male line, a person identified with their father's lineage, and uh, property was passed down from the father's family, and they were also patrilocal, meaning when a young married couple married, they lived with the husband's family. Um, so, in, in some ways, the direct opposite of the Chickasaw nation but also very similar to European and American culture. After all, remember, you know, those of us in the U.S. and a lot of European cultures, we trace our lineage from our fathers and take on our father's last name and things like that. That being said, the Quapa culture, much like the Chickasaw culture, the Quapa nation, much like the Chickasaw nation, uh, women were in charge of agriculture, planting, and harvesting and crops, and were also still the ones who owned the agricultural fields. And in both nations, um, men were uh, the chiefs, you know, the political leaders of the nation. They were in charge of warfare, hunting, and overseeing uh, public ceremonies. Uh, and here are the sources that I used for that. Uh, and then, of course, we need to take a look at warfare. Uh, Song Quapa warfare. So, uh, with that in mind, warfare was an important way for men to gain social prestige. Uh, warfare consisted mainly of raids and ambushes and was often focused on obtaining captives or obtaining control of hunting territory rather than, say, subjugation and conquest. Warriors would often employ strategies such as hiding in the forest during the day and traveling at night. Uh, attacking at daybreak while their enemy slept. Remember the, the DeSoto battle where the Chickasaw attacked DeSoto's camp at night while they were sleeping. Uh, warriors would oftentimes walk in single file in the same footprints to confuse enemy warriors uh, and would also use well-fortified villages for defense during a siege. Remember that in our video on the Chickasaw Wars and earlier in this video when talking about the Chickasaw Wars as, as well. Uh, the Chickasaw, in particular, were known for their mastery of waterborne combat due to their proximity to the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, often hiding secret caches of canoes for quick escape, as well as using rivers to quickly defend their large territories, while also using rivers to raid French ships and settlements, uh, as well as the settlements of rival Native American nations. And, of course, uh, 
as I've talked about a few times in the previous videos, often the Chickasaw Nation and other Native American nations would use the game stickball as a substitution for war to settle disputes between nations and villages. The Chickasaw Nation and other Native American nations of the Eastern Woodlands would also use stickball to train young men in the ways of war because of its roughness, and they would also use it as preparation for uh, imminent wars and raids. Uh, and, you know, this makes sense, uh, especially considering stickball is the direct ancestor to the modern sport of lacrosse. If you've ever seen a lacrosse game, you can get why <laughs> this would be used for preparation of uh, war and things like that. Now, to be fair, people could and did die in stickball games, but that would be far less often than, say, in full-scale war. But either way, all of these practices together would lead to sickball being called the little brother of war. Now, an interesting thing to point out about the Chickasaw and Quapa nations is that they had fairly low populations compared to uh, most of the southeastern Native American nations, uh, with their populations never exceeding more than uh, 8,000 individuals, uh, specifically talking about the Chickasaw Nation, uh, though generally the Chickasaw Nation itself, for example, only uh, only had a population of around three to 5,000 individuals, and of course, you know, the Quahua Nation had even less, you know, around 800 individuals at the highest. And this is from a period of between 1685 to 1835 CE, so of course there is a lot of variation. But despite that, both the Quapaw and the Chickasaw Nations had a larger than average population of warriors. Uh, for example, uh, despite their low population and the population that fluctuated between 3,000 to 5,000 individuals, the number of warriors uh, within the Chickasaw Nation alone, i.e. the number of warriors the Chickasaw Nation alone could field, has a constant estimate of you know, had a constant estimate of roughly 2,000 warriors, with a ratio of warriors to general population being uh, 7 to 2 at the lowest and 3 to 2 at the highest. So, you know, for example, 5,000, a population of 5,000 and 2,000 warriors, that would be the 3 to 2 ratio uh, and things like that. So, very large. And here are all the sources that are used for that. Uh, and this is specifically the source that I used for the population numbers. Uh, it is a master's thesis by Wendy uh, Sigilski, uh, titled a GIS-based analysis of Chickasaw settlement in northeast Mississippi between 1650 and 1840 CE. As you can see here, like I was talking about, generally uh, the average population during this time period for the Chickasaw Nation was most of the time more like around 3,000 to 4,000, but 5,000 was not uncommon. Uh, but during its earliest generations, they did have populations of, of at least 8,000, you know, of, of maybe uh, at most 8,000, 7,000, give or take. And this is based off of uh, repeated archaeological evidence, including in this thesis as well as uh, from earlier uh, archaeological excavations in 1989 and 2004. And here is a picture of stickball here. All right, so now we are going to, uh, because we talked about war warfare, we're going to take a look at the Chickasaw warriors and weapons in the 1800s. I do want to uh, very much uh, mention this before I move on. I did very much indeed look for depictions of Quapaw warriors. Um, I was not able to find any drawing or picture or any, anything like that of Quapaw warriors at all. So I do apologize to any members of the Quapaw Nation who are watching this. Um, but I was unable to find them. I'm sure they're out there, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to locate them, at least on the internet. So I do apologize for not showing what your warriors look like. But anyways, let's take a look at the Chickasaw warriors and weapons during this time period.
So generally, during the 1800s, Chickasaw warriors looked something like this. They wore clothing sort of like this. This was a Chickasaw war chief from the War of 1812, uh, but they also looked something like this. And in fact, a very, uh, a very often mentioned practice in European sources that the Chickasaw would use, you know, during warfare would be the shaving of their head to look, uh, look something like this. Like this, that's mentioned quite a lot in European sources in terms of, you know, in reference to uh, Chickasaw warriors. And the weapons that they would use were generally the same types of weapons that other Eastern Woodlands Native American warriors used. Now, of course, you see the tomahawk here, and as I've talked about in the previous videos, um, yes, the tomahawk is what most people think about when it comes to a weapon used by Native Americans, and they most certainly used it, but it's important to note the tomahawk is actually a sub uh, type, uh, a sub type weapon of the overall weapon classification of war club. So while they used it, it was not the only one they used. They used a variety of different war clubs. Some, like this one here, looked something sort of like a uh, what you would depict a European mace to be, and was used primarily for its blunt force trauma. Uh, very similarly, there would be these war clubs here that were just made out of some hard wood and could be used sort of like a club or say, you know, like you're hitting somebody with a baseball bat, you know, again, focusing mainly on the blunt force trauma aspect of it. But then there would also be weapons known as gun stock war clubs that were called that because they looked vaguely like the stock of a musket that would often have metal blades protruding out of them, one or more. Uh, and they would also sort of look like scimitar, you know, like curved swords of some sort, uh, and they could be used to great effect, uh, or often used to great effect by Chickasaw warriors and other warriors within the Eastern Woodlands. And then, of course, by this time in the 1800s, the Chickasaw were uh, utilizing steel and iron knives. Now, it's important to note that metalworking did exist in the Americas prior to European contact, but it was mainly focused on copper and bronze, not steel. I mean, there were some exceptions to this rule, uh, but by and large, the majority of metalworking in the Americas was copper and bronze based. Uh, steel knives did not become uh, very common throughout the entirety of the North American continent and other parts of the Americas like South America until after European contact. And then, of course, in that same vein, after European contact by the 1800s, the Chickasaw were utilizing as their primary ranged weapons things like muskets, like this brown bess here that was uh, the most common type of musket used in the 1800s, uh, as well as, of course, pistols. And now it's time to take a look at the governments of the Chickasaw and Fawpaw Nations. Uh, and as you can see in the slide, there are some similarities as well as differences between the governments of the Quapaw and Chickasaw nations. For example, both nations were divided into two divisions, with the Chickasaw nation being divided into the Chopped Hickory and the Worn Out House, whereas the Chickasaw was divided, whereas the Quapaw nation was divided into the Sky People and the Earth People. I do want to take a second to apologize to anyone from the Quapaw nation who may be watching this. I was not able to find uh, what the Sky People and Earth People would be called in the Quapaw language. So please feel free to correct me in the comments because I would very much actually like to know the correct term to call them because I was not able to find it. Um, they were both also governed by the uh, by a national council uh, with the Chickasaw National Council. Uh, being uh, consisting of leaders and accomplished warriors who were chosen by members of each town. Uh, meanwhile, the Quapaw Nation consisted of representatives from both divisions and each of the 21 clans of the Quapaw Nation, with the representatives of the divisions and clans coming together to make decisions, uh, political decisions for the whole nation, uh, and each group having specific rights and responsibilities for rituals and practices within the villages and the community at large. Um, the, Chick uh, the Chickasaw Nation had a peace chief called Minko, 
who was in charge of peace and foreign relations uh, and was selected by the National Council based off of merits and also possibly membership in a prominent clan. The Chickasaw had what was uh, known as the assistant Minko, the assistant chief who supervised the National Council and was the spokesperson and advisor to the Minko, to the chief. And the Chickasaw government had a war chief who was the chief in charge of war and who was selected based on his exploits and prowess in warfare. The Kwapa Nation uh, was very similar, but still had some differences in that. Uh, their leader was the great chief. He was the head of the nation. Um, however, his power was very limited, uh, with the great chief remaining bound by the system of mutual obligations and having to share what little power they had with other leaders. Uh, there was, after that, and arguably more important than the great chief in the Kwapa Nation, the clan chiefs, who were the leaders of each clan. And then there was, of course, the war chief, who was in charge of war and selected based on exploits and prowess. Uh, one th another thing that's important to point out is the Kwapa Nation's villages traditionally ruled themselves separately, with each village having two or three of its own chiefs. Uh, and here are all the sources I used for this information. All right, so now it's uh, important to take a look at the what Chickasaw and uh, Quapaw villages looked like during this time. So generally, during this time and after and, and before, uh, Chickasaw and Quapaw villages looked something like this uh, and this with, with some degrees of variation. Uh, and then, of course, after contact with Europeans in the United States, uh, specifically during the 1810s and 1830s CE, uh, the Chickasaw and Quapaw villages began to adopt American-style buildings, such as blacksmiths in the United States-style taverns. And now it is time to take a look at the economy of the Chickasaw and Quapaw nations. So the traditional Chickasaw and Quapaw agriculture was generally based on crops such as corn, beans, and squash, as was the case in most of the eastern woodlands, Native American nations, and really generally also a lot of the Great Plains and southwestern uh, Native American nations as well. Uh, but also the Chickasaw and Quapaw would hunt and harvest various animals, such as deer, uh, bison, especially those who were closer to the Great Plains parts of Arkansas and Mississippi, uh, as well as harvesting various types of fish, including, uh, <clears throat> sorry, including catfish. And then, of course, as we alluded to earlier in the video, the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations were major participants in the deerskin trade, which lasted from the 1670s well into the 1800s CE, uh, which is backed up very much in the archaeological record, as discussed in this paper titled Measuring Chickasaw Adaptation on the Western Frontier of the Colonial South, a Correlation of Documentary and Archaeological Data by J.K. Johnson et al. And they take a look specifically at uh, Chickasaw sites uh, ranging from a time period from 1650 to 1750 CE, so a hundred year time period. Uh, and what they found is that while deer remains existed, uh, were always present, you know, evidence of butchering of deer was always present in Chickasaw villages, um, especially in the earlier periods consisting of older deer uh, specimens. After contact with Europeans, the number of your specimens began to shoot up exponentially, especially the number of young deer specimens, as you can see here uh, and here. And this was very clearly a very profitable uh, economic venture for the Chickasaw and Quapaw. Uh, and which can be seen in the presence of things like gun spalls uh, of British and French origin, as well as gun parts also of British and French origin, and grave goods that were things like uh, glass beads that were also of 
European origin. So very clearly, they were. Uh, this was a very important part of the Chickasaw and Quapaw economy. Uh, and this is just a uh, this latter the final section of the uh, one of the final sections of the paper just to give you context for what the terms early, middle, and late, etc., uh, meant in context for this paper. But another thing that was a major part of uh, mainly the Chickasaw uh, economy, not necessarily as much as the Quapaw economy, was the adoption of European plantation farming and African chattel slavery. Now, I've already had a rant very similar to this in uh, a couple of in, in some of the previous videos, but it's a rant that I will do for all videos involving the Native American nations of the southeastern United States, because it is important to bring to really bring home, and that is the idea uh, and fact that uh, the Chickasaw treatment of enslaved African Americans was just as brutal as treatment by plantation owners in the United States. So yes. Wealthy Chickasaw individuals would build plantations and would obtain African American slaves, you know, enslaved African Americans in their poly, in their economy to harvest cotton, and they would treat them just as badly as white American plantation owners treated. I have often heard over the years several times. As an archaeologist and a historian, especially in my time uh, associated with museums that were connected to Native American nations, such as the Cherokee and the Muscogee Creek, that somehow the treatment of enslaved African Americans was better in Native American nations like the Chickasaw Nation than it was in the United States. That is not true at all. Across the board, whether it was in Native American nations, the United States, the British Empire, uh, the you know, colonial areas like the Caribbean, the treatment of slaves was horrific, period. No, no stop. It was the same across the board. Now, it could be, you know, the, the uh, mortality rate could be higher in some cases, but that, that doesn't account for things like lashings. That would not always result in deaths. And yes, Chickasaw, wealthy Chickasaw plantation owners would whip brutally their enslaved African Americans as punishment for any number of minor infractions. Now, I do want to say that this does not mean we need that this justifies the treatment of the Chickasaw Nation and other South, uh, southeastern uh, Native American nations by the United States at all. But we also don't need to diminish the experiences of enslaved African Americans within these nations, especially considering at most these would be like the great grandparents of a lot of African American people who are alive today. So it was not that long ago at all. All right, so now we're going to move on uh, and talk about um, another uh, sort of I don't want to necessarily say side effect, but another thing that began to take place as a result of contact between the Chickasaw Nation and the United States, and that would be that Presbyterian missionaries began to enter the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations, or they would start building mission, uh, mission stations and United States-style schoolhouses in attempts to convert the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations. And they would have some success converting the Chickasaw and Quapaw. You know, however, both of the Native American nations were more interested in the opportunity American-style schools provided their children to learn American trades and education in addition to, not in place of, in addition to their traditional teachings. So, you know, they were more interested in like, oh, my kid can go and learn how to be a silversmith or learn how to work a printing press. That was mainly what they were interested in. And again, there was some success. There were, you know, Chickasaw and Quapa individuals did convert to Christianity, uh, but that was not the main reason they accepted these schools into their nation. All right. Now that brings us to our next section, 
uh, next major section, the Chickasaw and Kwakwa Nations and Indian removal. So, uh, starting with uh, the Kwakwa Treaty of 1824 CE, which was a treaty that was signed between the United States and the Kwakwa Nation, uh, specifically by the Kwakwa, who were under continued pressure by the United States to cede all but 80 of their acres, uh, 80 acres of their land in the Treaty of 1824. And so under this pressure, they signed the treaty and just signed away all but 80 acres of their land to the United States. Uh, and then shortly after this, longtime opponent of all Native American nations, Andrew Jackson, would be elected president of the United States in 1828 CE. And just two years after that, his Indian Removal Act would be passed by a very narrow vote of 28 to 19 in the Senate and 100, uh, sorry, 101 to 97 in the House of Representatives on April 24th, 1830 CE. Now, as you will note, and as I've talked about several times in the previous videos, this was by no means, this vote shows that this was by no means uh, a universally accepted or universally wanted law to be passed. But unfortunately, that still did not stop it from uh, being passed. After the passing of the Indian uh, Removal Act, the Chickasaw Nation uh, would decide that it was better to survive west of the Mississippi rather than to become United States citizens east of the Mississippi. Uh, or at least I believe that's what it is. I'm making some degree of assumption. So if there are any members of the Chickasaw Nation watching this who have a different take on this please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section um but they would uh decide to move west of the mississippi and they would cede uh all all the remaining land east of the mississippi uh to the united states in exchange for relocation to an equal amount of land west of the mississippi river and what would become known as the treaty of Ponta uh, uh Ponta creek on october 20th, uh, 1832 CE. And just one year later, the Quapaw Nation, probably under similar beliefs as the Tucson Nation, would cede its remaining territory east of the Mississippi uh, to the United States and would be removed to the northwest corner of Oklahoma in 1833 CE. And you can see that all in this uh, picture here. However, the Chickasaw Nation uh, would be removed just a little bit later, or at least in totality would be removed just a little bit later than the Quapaw Nation, and that's because the Chickasaw Nation would uh, debate heavily with the United States for several years until finally the Chickasaw Nation got at least what they thought was the best deal possible, receiving $530,000 for the westernmost part of their land, uh, where they would then proceed to cross the, the Mississippi River following routes established by the uh, Choctaw and the Muscogee Creek Nations. Uh, though during the journey, more than 500 Chickasaw would die of dysentery and smallpox in what would become known as the Chickasaw Trail of Tears. Uh, and this would happen in 1837 CE. Here is the route that the Chickasaw Nation took. Uh, and one thing that I will, much like the slavery, uh, the the facts about slavery, one thing I do want to keep driving home in each of these videos is just how horrific these trails were for the Native American nations of the Southeast, like the Chickasaw. People died on these routes. You know, children, as you can see in this, children died of sickness and starvation and disease and had to be buried on the side of the road on the way. The elderly, the sick, people were starving. You know, again, dysentery was a common thing, uh, which, you know, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's essentially a horrific diarrhea death uh, is a uh, the a layman's term for, uh, for that. You know, dysentery, uh, dehydration, eventually hypothermia, and due to cold weather conditions from both rain and snow. These were horrific times that happened, and it happened because of the United States uh, and the United States' continued obsession with gaining more land. 
So with that, that leads us to our next section, the aftermath of Chickasaw and Quapaw removal. Uh, the Chickasaw Nation, once it reached Oklahoma, would, you know, Indian Territory would join with the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma, uh, becoming the Choctaw Chickasaw Nation, uh, whereas the Quapaw Nation would reform in the north east corner of Oklahoma, as you can see here. And this would all happen between 1833 and 1837 CE. Uh, around uh, 20, you know, 30 years later, the Chickasaw Nation would side with the Confederacy, the Confederate States of, of America in the American Civil War, um, partially to get back at the United States, but also because their economy was so heavily reliant on African American chattel slavery, and because the Confederate States of America, the Confederacy, started the Civil War over slavery. Sorry, lost causers, that's just a fact. Uh, the Chickasaw Nation were forced to side with the Confederacy because they too were a slave uh, holding nation, a slave reliant, enslaved African American reliant nation you know, reliant on the slave economy. Uh, eventually, though, it, as basically I'm sure everyone who's watching this knows, the United States would win the Civil War, the American Civil War, and after the Civil War, the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nation would uh, eventually decide to divide into two separate nations in 1866 CE. Which now leads us to our last section, the Chickasaw and Quapaw today. So the Chickasaw Nation uh, are still around to this day, and they are still located in Oklahoma, as you can see here. And this is their seal. Uh, and despite repeated and uh, sorry, uh, previous and continued attempts by the United States to eradicate and erase all Native American cultural practices, uh, the Chickasaw Nation has been able to hold on to, or, or at least uh, reconstruct uh, their cultural practices, i.e. hold on to the ones that were still around and reconstruct the ones that they had to uh, regain after the fact. Um, and you can see that here. So they are still very much alive, uh, both as a nation and as a cultural, culturally distinct people. And the same goes for the Quapaw Nation. Quapaw Nation still exists in the northeast corner of Oklahoma, as you can see here in this map here. Uh, and this is their seal. And again, like the Chickasaw Nation, despite previous and continued attempts by the United States to eradicate and erase all Native American cultures across the board, the Quapaw Nation has been able to both reconstruct and hold on to their traditional practices, as you can see here. All right, so with that, that ends our video on the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations in the early Imperial United States. Uh, I hope that y'all learned a lot from this video. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the parts of the video that were about the cultures of the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations, but I also hope that you really did not enjoy and were really not pleased to hear about the, the actions of the United States against uh, the Chickasaw and Quapaw Nations, because that's not the point. I don't want, you know, I don't want y'all to and be happy about that. The point of mentioning them in these videos and in the series is to bring to the forefront what the United States did and is still continuing to do to all Native American nations. So with that, I will end the video. Uh, if y'all would like to see me cover anything I mentioned in the video in greater detail in later videos, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, like, share, and subscribe, and I hope you all have a good day.